Traffic Jam is on now. What was your first impression of Rick Rubin when uh, he decided to come into the Rush, Rush production slash Def Jam uh, pegging order? You know, he's he's um, his overall demeanor has changed quite a bit in recent years, uh, certainly uh, since he's moved to Los Angeles, which would have been uh, 89, I think. Um, but back then, you know, his biggest uh, role model or role models came out of professional wrestling. And so he used to shout a lot and oh, I, I think more or less literally beat his chest a lot. Uh, he was very emphatic and, um, you know, it was, it was, you know, a, a thing. It was, uh, it was fine. I mean, really what was more uh, compelling about him, I'm just saying, you know, that's just his kind of, you know, public demeanor, you know, but when, when he wasn't, you know, kind of being, you know, uh, capital R, capital R, Rick Rubin in public, you know, he happened to be a super serious DJ and wannabe producer and, uh, you know, he made uh, Tila Rock's record. Uh, come on, Andre, I feel stupid. What's, what's T's record? That was just yours with D Tila Rock and DJ Jazzy J. Right. Okay. So, the, so he, make, he makes it yours. He probably made it in 83 and it really starts to take off in 84. And it deserved to because it was a great, great record. And when Russell found out, uh, you know, he, Russ would have been interested in any case, but when he found out it was this uh, so-called white guy, he was he was even more intrigued. And pretty soon, I think the two of them met, if they hadn't met earlier, they met during the taping of uh, Michael Holman's Graffiti Rock television show. And Rick was yes. hanging out the Treacherous Three at that time. And Russ was there with Ren DMC, who were also booked. And the two of them hit it off and the rest turned out to be history. Right, because the first record that was a Def Jam record was on a label called Streetwise with a guy named Arthur Baker. That's right. Yeah, I have a little history with things. That, that you, you get that when you're the DJ. You get to know the labels as they as they emerge and the, and the players start to actually play. How did Rush get along with different labels at the time, like the Tommy Boy labels, the Cold Chillin' label, uh, the Prisms, and uh, the Sutra labels, which had other buddy artists at the time and even with the Sugar Hill uh, label was there any competition amongst all that and with Rush because Rush always came across as being the leader from the management position well that's because in effect there was no management prior to that time certainly certainly there was no competent management uh, prior to that time you know listen uh, you and I could sit here all day long and praise Sylvia Robinson to the skies because God damn it, she was a powerhouse and she'd been a powerhouse since she started as a performer, a performer as little Sylvia in the early fifties. Uh, but you know, Sugar Hill was With a pillow great... talk and all that stuff. No, that's yeah. early. That's, that's the seventies. You know, she made a great record. Yeah. yeah in 1957. Uh, damn. She made a record uh, with a guy uh, named Mickey Baker. The, 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 they, they went as uh, so, Mickey and Sylvia was how they build themselves. And they made a record called Love is Strange. And that was, yeah. a, that was a big hit and it deserved to be. It was great. Anyway, Sylvia was magnificent in a lot of ways. But what she wasn't and what her husband wa wasn't, because the two of them were in business together, was they weren't artist managers. They had a very kind of conventional uh, uh, record label attitude and um you know so they they made you know a raft of great great records but they thought only in terms of records you know one of the things that russ used to say that that was very smart it seemed to me was he said we don't make records we build artists that's what he said mm -hmm. and that attitude made all the difference in the world. And it turns out actually to be kind of a, a smarter business model as well, because if all you're doing is trying to make records, you know, kind of, you know, let's just say that if you can build an artist, you also build an audience and a, and a record buying public. And that's not the way that Sugar Hill was thinking. But in any case, you know, listen, you know, your, your question about, you know, okay, so Rush on the artist management side, you know, because, you know, there was Def Jam, and, and, you know, the Def Jam artists were all managed by Rush, which uh, is a pure conflict of interest, although uh, we had some yes, 
we had we had some smart ass lawyer or another who who put on a serious face and say, oh, there's no conflict. It's a it's a confluence of interest. That's what he said. Uh, sure. But, um, you know, we also, you know, Curtis Blow recorded for Mercury. Uh, Houdini recorded for Jive. Um, Stetsasonic recorded for Tommy Boy. Um, you know, on and on like that. And, and you know, uh, by the fall of 85, the end of, you know, Def Jam was being distributed by Columbia Records. And so uh, we had to... Um, you know, establish working relationships with all of these folks. And, um, you know, at least, you know, from where I sat, it didn't seem like a very difficult thing. You know, it, it, we, it, we, uh, we got along well and uh, we just all rolled together and won. Now, Lior might have different ideas. Russell might have different ideas. I mean, you know, uh, they were, uh, uh, there's going to be, conflicts and there should be conflicts really between management and the label um, on behalf of the artist. And, uh, and there were conflicts and, and, you know, Russ and, and Lior would fight those fights. And, um, but, you know, but, but I didn't, I didn't see much of that. You know, all I had to do was, you know, write a press release, uh, write, write uh, um, a bio, uh, hire a photographer to take photos and, um, you know, and, and I was welcomed by the folks at the other at, at the labels. So you're watching the traffic jam. Now you also put out a book with uh, Jeanette Beckman called Rap. We had a lot of different photos of different artists at the time. Yours, yours included. Yours truly included from both positions, from not only just an artist, but then becoming a host of a show called Yo MTV Raps Today. With right, my partner Ed Love. That's what. Right. What made you come up with that? because of all these uh, different artists that were in this uh, great book called Rat. I'd been, I'd met Jeanette. That book came out in, in uh, early 1991, I think. And, um, you know, I'd known Jeanette for five years by that time. And I'd been hiring her uh, to take photos of our guys. And, you know, being uh, where I was, I met, I guess almost all the artists who were taking pictures of rappers at that time. And I've always been a guy who loves photography and um, it's just, um, it's, 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 it's a separate, it's a separate art form. Although, you know, obviously the, the promotional value to the uh, subject of these photos uh, you know, get, gets a nice bump. And that's, you know, why I was hiring these photographers, but I was also uh, a fan. And, you know, so, you know, five years on JB and I were pretty close and um, I might've suggested to her, you know, you, you've done enough work. You could put out a book. And at first she turned to, you know, Jeanette is English uh, and she, she moved to America. <sighs> I wish I knew, hey, let's say 1982, mm -hmm. but um you know, she, she maintained a network of friends uh, in the music business, including a lot of music writers and critics and whatnot, in London. And she turned to one of her pals and, and uh, asked him if he would join her to help get this book out. And he just somehow, you know, wasn't moved to do so. And so she turned around and asked me if I would help her. And I said, sure. And, um, you know, it turned out it wasn't hard for us to get a, a deal, a book publishing deal. And, um, you know, we went ahead and, and chose, you know, the, the top, yeah. 30, top 30 or 40 photos of hers and, and put it out. So I always, always I, want to thank you and thank her, because not only was I in, the, in there as a member of the group original concept, I was also in there, like I said, with uh, my partner at Lover from the OMTV Raps, which was well, Andre, Andre, that's that's just a credit to, you know, how uh, uh, creative you are. You know, you, mm. played, you, you played a bunch of different roles and, and uh, we had to capture you in, in these various ways, I guess. I know, and if, if I hung out long enough, I would have been in a picture with the Beastie Boys also. Speaking of the Beastie Boys, what was your first um, impression of them when you met them and they actually started coming through with uh, at Rush Communications and Russell decided to manage them? Well, you know, the thing about the Beasties uh, is that, you know, uh, off stage, off tour, uh, you know, they were, they were a lot calmer. 
uh, than they they were on stage and on tour, you know. Uh, and so it was, it was, um, you know, easier to just, you know, get to know them and, and, and shoot the shit with them. Um, uh, I, I was closest to ad rock, I think. Um, and, and things were fine. You know, I, I, there, there was no, uh, certainly there was no conflict, you know, and, and, you know, they made with Rick Rubin, you know, a magnificent album licensed to ill. Come on. That's a great, great album of, a, of, of the time. And I would say that its impact, you know, what, what I thought at the time was that, you know, the Beasties in 1987 were the Beatles. There was nothing bigger. You're watching The Traffic Jam. All right, so this move is gonna be for your love handles. If you have a kettlebell, go ahead and grab it. If you don't have one, you can go ahead and use a dumbbell. So I'm gonna take my kettlebell, I'm gonna clean it up so that it's here, resting nicely on my, uh, my wrist. And then I'm just gonna press it up, angle both feet the same direction. I'm gonna keep the weight in my back leg, there we go, and the weight in my heels. Now I'm gonna look at this bell the whole time it's above my head. I'm gonna poke my butt out like I'm trying to get it to the back corner of the wall, reach down, real strippery is how my teacher told me. And then I'm gonna come back up, really squeezing the obliques, squeezing the butt. Now, again, I just looked at you guys at the camera, but if you're doing this, you're gonna keep looking at your bell the whole time. I'm a little more experienced. Still doesn't make it a good idea, but squeeze the butt at the top, come all the way up. Oops, lost my balance. That's okay, it happens. And then we're gonna go back down and up. And then when you're done, just bring it down. And again, this will treat, this will definitely chisel those love handles. Let's go ahead and do the other side. Clean up. Squeeze. Notice both my feet are now angled the opposite direction. Bring it down. You're watching the traffic jam. Young man reached out to me and he's going through a hard time, isn't it? But it's not really him. It's his, his woman is going through a difficult time financially and he feels bad because he can't really do as much because he himself, you know, he came out of bad relationships and he's trying to get back on his feet and, you know, take care of his situation. But he, you know, he wants to do. For, yeah. And I commend this young man, you know, Real men, we we want to protect our woman. We want to spoil our woman. We want to, we can't watch our woman struggle. Like we do as much as we can. But you know, life is about make is about choices and making hard decisions. And he's at a crossroads. I said, so what do you do? I said, hey man, it's it's time that you leave this bitch and find yourself a woman with a better job. Let God take care of her, man. You got to. One is the magic number. You're watching the traffic jam. So the next exercise here, I'm holding here kettlebell. You can use elastic band or you can use a water bottle at home or you can just uh, do free weight with your body weight. Show you get stabilized, the car right tight, you go slow. Make sure your knee does not, does not move in and unwell. Always keep your heels in the floor. Squeeze on the top, always. Last two. You're watching The Traffic Jam.
This is the Traffic Jam.